Hello everyone, welcome to our live chat with Ling Tan. I am just adding her now. Hi to those joining. We're about to hop on with Ling Tan, who is working with us on a project called Growing Riversiders. So she is just about to join and we will get started. To all of those joining, we're just waiting for Ling Tan to join. And then we will get started with a few introductions. Hi to everyone joining. We are about to hop on with Ling Tan and we are just waiting for her to join. Sometimes it takes a little while, even though we're in art and technology. Oh, hello. how are you? Hi, yeah. I'm good. It only took us three tries, so. <laughs> <laughs> what was, how long was the, what was the longest that you ever had to deal with this at the beginning? Well, I once um, chatted with two people and we were in three, we were all in the US luckily, but we were in three different um, places across the US and having three people on a live chat is a lot. So that, <laughs> um, but let me just start with some introductions. So to everyone listening and watching, my name is Madeline Pierpont. I manage partnerships and development for Lumen Art Projects. Um, and we are incredibly excited to have Ling Tan on with us today for our live chat. We haven't done a live chat in a while, so we're very excited to get back into the rhythm. Um, and without further ado, let me introduce Ling. Uh, welcome, Ling. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're really excited to be chatting about the project that Lumen Art Projects is working on you with and your practice in general. So. To start, I wanted to ask about your classical training as an architect and how that informs your work with art and technology. Um, to be honest, I'm still trying to make sense of this because um, I think in every project that I do, it kind of emerge in different ways. But I think I tend to look at project from an overall system design perspective and how it affects the environment and also looking at how uh, each interaction, what is the meaning in each interaction, and also um, how would a person experience something. And um, I think that has to do with the architectural background that uh, I came from, and it also makes me, to be honest, I think working in uh, architecture uh, companies uh, prior to being an artist also gives me some experience in kind of looking at project from a more pragmatic and service-oriented point of view, in a sense, in which that I... Um, I look at things in a way that whether it satisfies the people that are involved in it, hence the community engagement part to see how, uh, whether other communities that were involved in the project, do they get something out of it and did they enjoy the process, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so a lot of your, your practice, or I, forgive me if I'm misspeaking, but most of your practice really does center around community engagement and community participation. So I wonder how how you came to be interested in that and why that um, as a way to engage with the arts really inspires you and wants you to, to continue creating exciting projects like Growing Riversiders. I think what excites me about community engagement is really the unpredictability of it, um, that you can't really preempt what to expect from any engagement, say if it's a workshop or if it's a project. Uh, and also you definitely can't envision what the outcome is going to look like. And uh, you just have to take a leap of faith and believe that we together with the community can create something at the end together. It's rather risky. And I think that's what really excites me about doing work with communities uh, itself. And, um, but I think one thing that is really interesting is also, even though it's unpredictable, it's also very structural in a sense that, for example, you can design different ways of structuring participation with different groups of people to create 
um, a format of an outcome. So be it a performance, be it growing an artwork together, or be it data collection. Um, and, um, but I think one thing for sure is that the outcome is definitely different in every context, and I think that's what's interesting about it. Um, so, yeah. So to talk a little bit about the project Barking Riverside, Growing Riversiders, um, our, our Luminart Projects colleague, Jack Addis, is really spearheading this with you. Um, so for those who are listening and don't know much about it, I wondered if you could first describe what Growing Riversiders is and then how you were inspired to create it and start it and what the, the evolution of the project has been. Uh, sure. So uh, Growing Riversider is a participatory project that involves working with local residents in Barking Riverside, which is a new mixed-use development area uh, east of London uh, in, uh, here in UK. And uh, it involves work uh, collaboratively, sorry, it involves them collaboratively growing a 400-pixel artwork. Uh, that represents their collective identity of their new neighborhood. And the way they do it is through growing plants. So participants gather to first choose the plant types and design the image itself that represents their environment. And uh, then almost 100 families across uh, the borough then each bring home a set of plants and individually grow and nurture 400 plants at home uh, over six weeks period. And the effort then culminates in this uh, artwork assembly uh, over a weekend where they come together, they bring the plants to the ecology center to assemble this large scale artwork that uh, make completely out of plants that grow at home and install as a flower bed at this, uh, at the WOWS, which is a new ecology center that's opening at Barking Riverside. So the way the image was chosen was from a selection of uh, images that were designed by the local residents uh, in Barking Riverside as well. The winner being the depiction of a honeybee image. And the project is also, um, part digital as well because it involves participants using a custom digital platform to design the image, to keep in touch, share growing tips and advice, and also record how their plants have grown uh, into pixels of the final image at the end. And, um, and also the project was kind of conceived uh, during COVID period, during the COVID lockdown, where we really want to see how we can create a pro project that enables them to still do something collective and still have a physical outcome at the end. So in the end, this project was kind of envisioned during that time where the idea was really to create something that's part digital and part physical and have some form of uh, permanence and legacy afterwards. So how did, uh, I'm just out of curiosity, how did they choose the, the honeybee? Why is that? I mean, I saw the, it happened this weekend, right? The, the actual planting happened this weekend and I saw an image of it and it looks incredibly cool. Do you know why specifically the bee was chosen over other? other <laughs> I think, I mean, I was actually quite glad that the bee was chosen because there were a lot of other images that were really great as well, but you can tell that there's a higher risk of the image not being legible. Mm -hmm. So I think one of, part of the project involves, at the beginning, involves trying to figure out how are we going to create an image that, because, Imagine growing 400 plants together. So there's already a lot of risk. Whether is it going to grow well? What's the season going to be? Especially this year in UK, the weather hasn't been very good as well. So we were quite lucky to have managed to survive in terms of growing the plants, for <laughs> the plant parents growing the plants. So, um, so there was a lot of risk involved. So at the beginning, there was also a lot of uh, discussion on how do we de-risk the project in the sense that to enable them to have a certain ownership of it, but also make sure that the outcome is something that they'll be happy with. So the way we go about it was that we decided to grow 100 set of plants uh, uh, with the plant experts that were based in the ecology center so that um, the black silhouette of, if you see in the image itself, the black silhouette, sorry, the black silhouette was grown by the plant experts in the ecology center and the rest of the plants were grown by the plant parents. So being that itself, it actually enables us to create a work that has a very clear silhouette and have, having other plants that were grown by the plant parents filling the colors of it, if you see what I mean. So mm -hmm. that kind of makes it uh, into, I would say, a better outcome at the end. But um, the way it was chosen by the participant were that they knew the, the context uh, prior to it. So we were always encouraging them to select an image that they also know that will have an outcome at the end. Mm -hmm. So they chose the honeybee in the end. And the one that they would want to see every day because it's their community, right? Yes, yeah. So do you have an interest in general in ecology 
and the environment? Or is this one of your first projects that's really employing physical and digital and, and dealing with plants? It's the first time I'm dealing with plants, but um, I've always been uh, interested in ecology, not in the sense of, I mean, so growing plants was something that is completely new, but I've always been doing projects that's part digital and physical. I think partly because of my architecture background. So even though I'm doing a lot of digital technology work, but I've always make sure that every project has a physical outcome in the end, because ultimately you want the people to feel that they have done something that has a permanence in the environment that they are living in. And um, the reason why I was, I was interested in growing plants was also I've been doing a lot of projects that deals with uh, tackling climate crisis. So mm -hmm. growing plants is another way of really figuring out how, what is our relationship with nature and how do we actually um, nurture this relationship that will improve the environment that we live in. So in the project has, you said earlier that you never know really how the community participation is going to play out. It's always an unexpected outcome. Did people interact with this project in an unexpected way or, or did it take a path that you weren't necessarily projecting, thinking about it from the beginning? You know what? I think what was really interesting was when I started this project because it was during COVID lockdown and we have been kind of in isolation for almost a year at that point. So there was a lot of question, I mean, question mark regarding will people take on the platform? Will people come to, this, come to take the plants home? Will people actually put in effort to grow the plants? So I think what was really interesting for me was the fact that, um, I mean, given that the project has come to this phase where the artwork has been is assembled, I think what was really surprising for me was the level of participation that people have for the project. Because when we did the artwork assembly over last weekend, there was a huge high turnout from plant parents. Almost all of them came except four, and two of them was, couldn't come because of COVID isolation. Wow. So, so it was really amazing that people actually stay on throughout the process, the whole, the whole period of time. And also the other thing was also the question of whether will people use the digital platform to keep in touch with each other and, um, and upload photos. And I think also one thing that was surprising was that there was a lot of high usage of the platform. I think mainly people were really interested in growing and because the platform offers growing tips and also a platform for them to ask questions, uh, you start to gain a community where people start to reply to growing questions as well. So you start to gain traction where people start to look at the website more and have an incentive to upload photos because they want people to monitor their plants as well. So I think that was really interesting for me. So what are the next steps in the, in the project? So the artwork is going to be exhibited for another month at the Ecology Centre and afterwards the plant parents will come back and bring their plants home. So they can bring back the specific plants they have been growing and um, to bring it home with them. And I think one thing to say as well which was really interesting was during the artwork assembly there were a lot of plant parents that kind of couldn't say farewell to their plants and you just hear a lot of plant parents saying, oh, <laughs> My plants, I'm going to leave my plants here for a while. And just they started talking to their plants. So that was really amazing as well. And um, I think they can't wait to have their plants back afterwards, I think. That's so <laughs> touching to see. I'm sure that you also found people that w had never worked with plants before or were not naturally gardeners, but wanted to be involved in the project. Yeah, yeah. There was, I remember one plant parent specifically who said that she, it was her first time growing plants. She was kind of using this as an experiment to see whether she has the ability to keep something alive and she say it works. So she's going to buy more plants in the future. So I think that was something that I felt really quite nice to hear as well. That's great. So to switch gears a little bit to your other projects, I know that Luminart Projects worked with you a little bit on um, playing democracy. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about other projects that you have done or works that you've done that have um, elicited community participation and what the response to those was in the past? Uh, so I've just recently finished uh, working on this project called the Climate Exploration Cookbook. So it was in uh, collaboration with Chinese Art Network and also Season for Change, uh, which is, uh, uh, and they are looking for projects that deals with um, working with communities to tackle climate change, uh, sorry, climate crisis. Um, and so the project was quite interesting because I was working with a group of um, Chinese participants in London to explore climate issues through looking at their cooking and eating habits. 
So, uh, so we were experimenting with cooking and experimenting with a series of traditional Chinese dishes and to figure out ways to make it lower in carbon. And um, afterwards, the chef we got we invited a chef to interpret the recipes as well and cook a version which is based on what the participant have designed. So I think that is quite interesting, just because it's uh, again engaging on a bigger topic, but with a set of uh, sorry a set of participants who don't necessarily um, can um, have that have their conversation, have their voice heard especially I think in UK. So I think that was quite exciting uh, for me and also for Chinatown as well. And the idea is to make it into a bigger project that kind of engages with more Chinese participants from different parts of London and UK. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question, by the way. Well, I mean, that sounds incredible, <laughs> incredibly neat. So to speak a little bit more abstractly, what, other than community participation, what inform, what perspectives inform your practice in general? How have you seen your practice evolve over the years? I think over the years, um, so it started off with kind of looking at technology and architecture, and then it started evolving to community engagement. And I think the reason why it was really exciting was, I think I mentioned earlier on, which is when you work with people, it's very unpredictable. But I think the more I started working on uh, within this field, the more I find that it's really interesting in terms of the social, um, political layer and to actually figure out ways to work with people that kind of make them aware of the issue. But I think one thing that really interests me in the next step is to figure out whether there's a way to introduce more systemic change to the environment we live in and whether can we work with ordinary citizen to elicit a change in, for example, their neighborhood or um, in the borough that they live in. So that's something that I think um, hopefully in the future years I could work towards that. But um, but yeah, I think I think the social dimension is something that uh, is slowly being introduced in the work that I'm doing now, and um, also this kind of more political kind of agenda to it. It's it's incredibly powerful, I think, especially because as we try to heal and move on uh, from COVID, community participation and engagement will be even that much more important. Of course, it was important before, but especially because we have been separated from one, one another and there hasn't been that physical interaction. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the next few years. Well, it looks like yeah. we're just about out of time, but to ask you one last question, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, what are you working on right now and what are you working on into the next into the next year or so? So um, I have a few projects that's going on currently, but I'm currently focusing on this uh, project that I've been developing for the past five years. It's called uh, Superpower and it's a citizen data collection project that um, uh, that involves working with communities to tackle issues in their environment. And in this version that I'm working on, uh, it involves working remotely with a uh, young participant from London, Johannesburg, and Bulawayo in Zimbabwe to uh, explore gender safety issues uh, through this gesture sensing digital platform that I'm developing at the moment. And so that's quite exciting because I'm really interested to see how we can use um, web platform in a much more kind of um, as a tool to um, record data and also to see how we can use that to make sense of the issue and hopefully uh, get the participant to figure out ways in which they can change their environment that they are living in. So that's kind of one project I'm excited about. And um, there's another project that I'm currently working on uh, and I'm developing an outdoor performance piece that uses wearable tech and involves working with communities in different parts of UK to um, collect stories uh, surrounding people's empathy, uh, agency and collective actions towards changing their environment. And uh, asking them to perform with the audience through the stories that they, um, they have recorded. So that's another piece that I'm quite excited about. Wow, that sounds incredibly cool. When does that launch? Um, it's actually happening at the moment. I'm actually working with different towns uh, in UK, but it's still an R&D phase. And hopefully in uh, next year, we'll be touring it in different parts of UK. Well, I look forward to hopefully seeing it when it, when it does, when it is touring. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Ling, for coming on. It was great to chat with you, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. You too. Or thank you. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Bye. a lot for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.